I want to see action. I want to see change. I want to see investment. I want to see not that EDI is something you need to do, but that this is a value we have in our organizations. Welcome to Arts Engines. I am your host, Aaron Dworkin. It is great that you are able to join us for today's guest, who is Michael Kaiser, who oversees the DeVos Institute and who has an incredible history. You can look everything up online uh, in terms of really being, if you will, one of our arts leaders, arts leader. So welcome, Michael. It is so great to have you here on the show. Thank you so much, it's great to be here. So, you know, uh, not only at DeVos, which I wanna ask you about, but obviously you were the longtime president of the Kennedy Center and a host of other big institutions, you know, Alvin Ailey. Um, and in this moment that, uh, you know, we're in, in terms of the challenges that arts organizations face, um, you spend a lot of time delving into all of these weeds. Is there just kind of a top high level kind of strategic, you know, advice guidance that you would kind of start off with to say, here is what people in the arts who are leading organizations should be thinking about, should be doing right now, kind of at that highest level? I think most importantly, arts organizations now need to plan. I, I see a lot of organizations reacting to COVID, to the anti-racism movement, to the general challenges we face running cultural institutions in the world today, to the changes in technology and all. And I think it's really important not just to react. I hear the word pivot a lot, and not just to pivot, and not just to make statements, but to really think and delve and plan how your organization is gonna move forward in a smart, enlightened way, rather than just what can you do to satisfy the moment. Gotcha. So, you know, it's always funny, uh, you know, when I was in my old role at, at Sphinx, I would often talk with organizations about diversity um, or inclusion. And a lot of times, if they were an organization in crisis, they would say to me, well, you know, we're, we would love to, but we've got, you know, our budget, our boards falling apart, our buildings falling apart, you know, et cetera. We don't have time for diversity. For in this instance, for organizations, as you kind of talk about the planning, what do you say to those organizations who say, well, we'd love to plan, but, but we can't because we're, you know, just figuring out opening our doors or we're just trying to figure out the gap in our budget or what do you say to those who are consumed by the present about the fact that I really don't have the time or space to plan? I say two things. The sort of smart alecky answer is that's exactly what people are saying about the arts in our community. And when we say the arts are so pivotal, and people say they're extra. Um, so that's the sort of smart aleck answer. But the, the more substantive answer is, I'm trying to help arts organizations make the next year easier, not harder. And I find that if you don't plan and act in a thoughtful way, you get, your life gets harder each year, not easier. And so I believe arts organizations need to invest some time in thinking through where they are, where they want to be, and how they're going to get there so that they actually can attain what they want to attain and life gets happier and easier year by year. So with the work that you know that you do at DeVos, right, you're you're engaging with so many organizations and leaders around the world, really. Um, is there something that you see or a few things that you see that are really rising that you know, kind of, this is the big 
top two or three things that kind of everyone's dealing with. I'm curious for audience, both for those who are leaders who might feel a little better, like, oh, okay, I'm not the only one dealing with this. Right. Uh, but then also, you know, the practitioners and the artists and the audiences who also are, are tuning in to go kind of, what are, what are our institutions facing? Are there a couple, two sure. or three things that are rising to the top? Sure. Well, sort of the obvious answers are that we're dealing with COVID and its impact on organizations and the loss of earned income, basically no ticket sales for a while. And the other is the need to join the anti-racist movement and the need to do this thoughtfully and not just issue a statement, but to really make change. Those are two that are huge and important and I don't want to minimize them, but I want to talk sort of pre-COVID and pre the immediate um, recognition of the need to fight racism and say that in general, what I think arts organizations need to do is to really be thinking about how they build their revenue streams. I've, I've done a lot of analysis of arts organizations um, of all different kinds and so many have not been able to build their earned income over the last decade since the last recession. And so they're relying increasingly on contributed income. There's nothing wrong with that, except I believe we're wasting an opportunity. And so I think that's something that underlies a lot of the sentiment you express, which is we'd like to deal with this, but we don't have the time. One of the reasons they don't have the time is because they don't have the people resources. And one reason they don't have the people resources is they don't have the revenue to pay for it. And so I think this is something that we address with virtually every organization we work with, which is how do we build your revenue stream so you can afford to do the work you want to do in a way you want to do it. So this kind of is a great segue, and of course, I want to tackle some of the, you know, anti-racism, DEI sure. uh, work. Um, but before that, to go to revenue. Um, so there are, you know, a lot of organizations that are, of course, struggling with, do we go online and do our, what are we doing live and all of that. And one of these things that seem to happen with the huge rise of everything online is somehow everybody thinks the arts should be for free online. All of a sudden, if whatever we did in the hall, I pay a ticket online, it's free. Uh, what are your thoughts or what would you say to organizations and or the artists at those organizations of that pull to kind of do things online for free? And if there are so many things, if we all of a sudden start charging, why will anyone actually pay us if they can see something else it's, for free? It's a very serious issue. And it's the exact problem the newspapers got themselves into which was they started giving everything for free until they realized they were going bankrupt. Then they started to try to charge. And only a few newspapers can really have a paywall because not everyone wants to pay for every newspaper. They'll pay for the New York Times. And so I think that we have to take a lesson from that. And I have no, nothing, there's nothing wrong with online arts. There's wonderful things you can see online. But I think arts organizations have to be very careful not to overinvest in arts online if they believe that we will be back in physical performance within eight months or 10 months or 12 months and not to force not to spend all your time energy and money planning your online work save a little bit of time energy and especially money for how you're going to come back with a bang when we actually can earn some income gotcha are there, do you think, you know, there's a lot of talk about how, you know, there, we will go back to a new normal there, right? We won't ever go back to the way things were before COVID. Um, it, do you kind of uh, ascribe to that? Or do you think there yeah. are aspects that will permanently change as it relates to art? So, you know, there's things that certain workplaces, certain people that started working remote, they actually might stay remote post COVID. Do you think there are some things that will change in the arts field? I think that there will be more online work because people are getting used to it and we're starting to realize how we can use online, hopefully in interesting ways. I'm still waiting for someone to be a genius about how to use online in some way that we haven't seen before or used before. Um, so I think there will be a growing trend to online. I think a lot of our customers 
our audiences, our, our students are realizing how much they love online. You don't have to be at a certain place at a certain time. And I wrote a whole book about that called Curtains. I, I do see a, a gradual shift to online. COVID has, amp, has accelerated that. But I do see over the next 20 years a real movement to online work for, because of cost, because of convenience. Um, but I also think there's a huge demand for in-person art because the arts are, part of what the arts are, are social activity. And we hunger for social activity. And we're realizing now in the COVID world how much we miss social activity. And I do believe that when we are feel healthy and safe to go back into a theater, there's going to be a burst of energy and excitement to do so because people are going to be so happy to share and experience with some other people and enjoy it together. So I do think there'll be some changes. I also think we will return to, I think, much to an exciting in-person physical presence um, as well. What I worry about is, number one, that many organizations will not survive this phase while we're waiting to have in-person physical experiences. And number two, I worry that we're not gonna learn from COVID some of the things that we can learn. For example, the importance of a cash reserve. Um, not just the organizations themselves, but also arts funders who never were really that great about funding cash reserves. I think need to think about this, how important it is not to be reliant on emergency funding when something bad happens. The average arts organization in this country has less than two months of cash on hand. And we've seen the impact of that in the last few months. And so I think that's one of the things. There's other things, the value of stewarding your best donor relationships, the importance of boards and staffs really working together to solve problems, not at each other. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned from COVID that I hope will be learned so that when we do come back, we can come back stronger rather than weaker. Great. So, you know, back to the issues surrounding anti-racism, uh, sure. DE and I work, obviously something that you have spent a significant amount of time during, during your career working on and uh, obviously has been a major focus for me. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't I just start off with just the generalized question of where do you think the trajectory of the issue of anti-racism is, how is that going to manifest in the arts? Do you think sometimes, you know, we see things and over my lifetime, I've seen, you know, various things happen in society and you see them and they come and they go, they fade, people focus on it for a few weeks and it's gone. What's your sense of the trajectory of the, um, uh, of the issue of anti-racism in the arts? I don't know yet. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that, that there's gonna be a serious, thoughtful process on every side of this issue for arts organizations. I'm hopeful that organizations will do more than issue statements of support. I don't wanna read another statement of support, to be honest. Um, I wanna see action, I wanna see change, I wanna see investment, I wanna see not that EDI is something you need to do, but that this is a value we have in our organizations, that we are not fulfilling our missions if we do not make our organizations equitable and diverse and speaking to a wide range of people. And I'm hopeful that we can engage in this, people of color and white people together in a thoughtful, planned way to really make change within organizations and not just to issue statements or set up a task force or try a little harder to get board members of color or try a little harder to get staff members of color. That's not enough. And I don't think this can be rushed. I don't think the answers are easy. And I think they require a lot more than a statement of solidarity. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you say to, you know, we obviously can't tackle, you know, every organization's issues relating to, say, diversity or inclusion, because they're so varied and what different organizations have to, have to do is, is different. Um, but what do you say generally to the organizations, which we certainly could hear from a number of them, we've got 
COVID issues. We have these things. I don't have the money to invest in, I, I'm not racist. I love diversity, but I don't have the money or the bandwidth or the time or the staff. What, what, what can I do? What should I do? What, what, what do you, how do you respond to that? Unfortunately, when you say I'm not racist, but I don't have the time, that to me sounds racist. Um, so I don't, I don't accept that as an answer. And I think what has to, as you said, in each case, it's a bit different. And in each case, that means you have to do some deep thinking, not just personal soul searching, but real thinking and analysis of what is right in our organization and what is wrong in our organization. And how are we going to address the things that need to be addressed? And then we have to do it, not all at once, because you can't, not just financial resources, but changing organizations in any way, forgetting the topic, takes some time, it takes thoughtful adjustment and change and, and real measuring that change and working towards a goal. But you have to do that work. And I don't think we have an option right now, or we should never have had that option. <laughs> um, but I think now we have to address it. We can't say we don't have the time. And I'll be really honest with you, Aaron. I'm talking to a lot of organizations right now. We offered a free hour of consulting to any organization in America that wanted it. And we did 431 of these hours. So we talked to a, pretty, to a pretty large sample. I'm really impressed with the seriousness that a lot of organizations are now, with which they are addressing this concern. I want to make sure it is consistent. I want to make sure they actually stick with it and that they actually make change. But people are talking about it now differently than I have experienced in my 35 year career in the arts. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. There's, uh, with uh, each guest, I always like to kind of see if there were three, if you could kind of distill three takeaways that you hope viewers, whether they be leaders, administrative leaders, or practitioners, um, that you would kind of say, you know, take this away from, from this. Think, consider these, you know, two or three things. Uh, as you continue to do this work, what would those be? Specifically on the EDI work or in general? Uh, it, in general, in general. I, I think key for me is number one, that organizations do need to analyze where they are in a, in a rather deep way and objective way. And th that's number one. Number two, don't believe conventional wisdom. Um, really think through the solutions for your organization, what is true for your organization. And as you work going forward, make sure that you truly are a team working on these issues. That's board and staff and artists. We're not working against each other or at each other. We truly all have a vested interest. If we believe in the missions of our organizations, we have a vested interest in moving forward in solidarity. And that means we have to address these issues squarely, honestly, but without recrimination, and with a focus on what are we going to do to change and be a better organization. And that's with respect to EDI, or marketing, or fundraising, or programming, or whatever it is. But we cannot, it's hard, it's so hard. It was hard to run an arts organization a year ago. It's hard, it's a difficult profession. It's difficult to be a good board member of an arts organization. And if you're gonna do it well, it takes, some, it takes a team, it takes a village, it takes all of us working together. We have enough challenges surrounding organizations. We have to work together to make, to make change and to, to move positively forward. Awesome. So unfortunately, we're just about out of time, but I wanted to kind of get a sense you you've spent just this, you know, extraordinary career working very hard on these issues leading arts organizations. And I, I wonder why what 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 drives you? Why do you feel so passionately about this work? You could have worked, you know, in any number of fields and and could have maybe not worked as hard, but you're you're driven to it clearly. Why? I started out because I liked the arts. It just was something that for me was fun and enjoyable. 
But I had the great fortune to work with a man named Barney Simon, who was the founder of the Market Theater in Johannesburg, which was a truly important theater. For those who don't, and who are listening to this, who don't know it, look up the Market Theater. It, it changed the world. They, they played a major role in the end of apartheid in South Africa. And Barney said to me, you know, Michael, you're, you think you're so smart and you think you, you, know, you can turn around organizations, but what you really have to do is change the world. And that's why we are doing the work we're doing, he said. And he was right. And that his mentorship really changed me. And I realized that we in the arts, we do bring beauty to the world. We do bring excitement, inspiration to the world, but we also can change the world for the better. And I think the world we're living in right now needs to be changed for the better. And we have the opportunity to lead that. Michael Kaiser, you truly are one of the great arts engines that is powering human creativity in our field. Thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Thank you so much.